Hello, everybody, and welcome to Marion Moments, being brought to you by Church Militant during the Wuhan virus pandemic, just to keep our thoughts focused on the supernatural. We're talking all of this week about typology and uh, various things in the Old Testament and how they are revealed in their completeness in the New Testament. That's the, uh, we're, we're going to get into an awful lot of this because it's called Marian Moments. We're going to go back into the Old Testament, really for the remaining two and a half-ish or so weeks that, we're, uh, that we know we're on. We're going to, supposed to, open, reopen Michigan on May 15th, which is a Friday, and that will be the last uh, episode of this running at one o'clock in the afternoon during the weekdays while we're here. Uh, just as a little quick whip around, guys, can you show the, uh, show the, somewhat bare bones empty studio you can see there isn't an awful lot of activity going on here all the people that normally occupy all those desks and the craziness and everything are actually uh off-site at their homes working uh from their homes so uh that's kind of why things look a little haphazard uh sometimes in the production here of this show is we don't have a full crew in there you do have the heroes sitting in the control room guys give yourself a shot there and wave and turn wave. there you are there there's the heroes three bodies that are normally about seven or eight bodies to produce a show so uh, that's our our condition right now so as they say in the construction trade, pardon our mess, uh, excuse our dust, but uh, things will be back to normal. Uh, so again, this show, the whole rest of the time, I want to talk about typology because how it refers to our Blessed Mother. But as a little precursor, the show that we have done was inspired by this little book, Mary Day by Day. Uh, those of you who are new, it is a so marvelous little book. It has, uh, it's almost a booklet, it's so tiny. Uh, each day, all 365 days of the year are accounted for in there to give you, you know, roughly a minute, maybe a little less of time meditating on some beautiful things about our Blessed Mother. We go to the uh, uh, scripture passages, then we cover um, uh, a reflection by a saint on that particular passage, and then we have a prayer after that. So we'll do that right now. Go to this. This is for today, April 28th, uh, from the book of Judith. You are the glory. Judith, by the way, is a type of our Blessed Mother from the Old Testament. You are the glory of Jerusalem the surpassing pride of Israel, the great honor of our people. You have done this with, you have done all this with your own hand. A reflection from Pope Pius IX, the Blessed Virgin was united with Jesus in the closest and most indissoluble bond. Together with Jesus and through Jesus, she was the eternal enemy of the poisonous serpent, overcame him, and crushed his head with her virginal foot. And I want to hold on that for a second, leave it up, guys, for a moment. You can see here that the very long tradition, and this is what Pope Pius IX is repeating, he's repeating, this is in the 20th century, he's repeating this tradition way back, the understanding that from Scripture, from Genesis, it is the Blessed Mother, uh, the woman who crushes the head of the ancient serpent. So just a little underscore of that for you there. Uh, our prayer, O Mary, in union with your divine son, you have overcome the powers of evil. Come to my aid when evil threatens to overwhelm me and deliver me from all danger. Leave this up for just one second longer, guys, please. If you notice in the scripture passage, you are the glory of Jerusalem. In yesterday's show, we talked about how whenever you encounter something in the Old Testament, an account of Jerusalem as in sort of the archetypal Jerusalem, it is, uh, it's the church. Jerusalem is the church, the heavenly Jerusalem. We're going to get into all of this in these next coming weeks, but uh, we'll, I'll just short circuit around that and say uh, the church has always been viewed as the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, as St. John tells us in the Apocalypse. And uh, when we say that you are the glory of Jerusalem, uh, when we're talking about that in the book of Judith, that is a reference to our Blessed Mother. In the future, obviously in time and space, that's a reference to the Blessed Mother. You are the glory of the church. So anyway, let's talk about typology. Let me call up a little graphic for you that we had yesterday, just to remind you what typology is, or if you're joining us for, you missed yesterday's show, typology is in theology and biblical exegesis, which is trying to get to the root of what's meant by any particular scripture passage. Typology concerns itself with the relationship of the Old Testament to the New. Now, what is the relationship between the Old and the New? Well, look, there has to be a relation. There's all relationship. 
unless you say the Old Testament has nothing to do with the New Testament. Well, if they have something to do with each other, then there's a relationship. So what is the nature of the relationship? Well, typology is one way of getting at that. Now, we had up yesterday for you that uh, some examples of that, that uh, a, a, a type is a prefigurement of what's going to be the case. You know, this, it's, it's sort of, a, it's a type of what we're going to see. So a drawing of a car, for example, is the type of the actual car sitting there, the blueprint of the house with maybe even a little scale model of it and the architect's drawing of it. You know, you see those lots of times. All those things, those are types of the actual finished product. So the type is, the, is what points to and has a great deal of resemblance to, even though it's not the finished thing. That's what a type is. Yesterday we went through how uh, Adam was a type of our Lord, making our Lord the new Adam. Well, another uh, sort of you know star of the Old Testament is also a type for our blessed Lord, for Christ, and that is Moses. We have a few examples here for you. So again, Moses is the type, Christ is the fulfillment. Now, as we see here that there was in this case, what did Moses do? He led the people out of Egypt, led them to the, you know, to the promised land, didn't go on himself because he struck the rock twice. When our Lord, when Lord God told him to strike it once, he struck it twice, he disobeyed, so he didn't get to cross over into the promised land. He got right to the border, and then they had to bury him on Mount Nebo. But anyway, uh, so Moses led the Exodus. Christ leads the new Exodus. The Exodus, in the first case, was from Egypt to the promised land. What is the new Exodus? The new Exodus is from the promised land to heaven. So our Lord leaves, departs Jerusalem, the center, the heart of the Holy Land, which is where Moses led them to, and uh, leads people to heaven. So that's the new Exodus. So what are some other similarities? What are some indications that Moses is a type for our Lord? Well, uh, Moses fasted on Mount Sinai for 40 days and nights. Our Lord fasted in the desert for 40 days and nights. Now hold on that for a second, guys, as well. Remember that you have to ask yourself, why are some things being written in the first place? Why is the Holy Spirit inspiring some of the scriptures to be written? Why would it be important for us to know that it was 40 days that he fasted in the desert? Well, because it, it hooks back up to the, to the type of Moses fasting on Mount Sinai for 40 days. Anything that pops up in the New Testament, any little bitty detail, generally is uh, the, the context for understanding this typology. All right, a next point. Uh, Moses fed the uh, Jews in the desert with manna, and our Lord multiplied the loaves in the wilderness. He fed them too. Now, on this specific point, we have a couple of sub-points here. First one is the crowds themselves bring up Moses with the sign. So what are we talking about here? That our Lord, and come back to me for a second, guys. The, our Lord says, you know, he performs the multiplication of the loaves, feeds the thousands, the whole bit. And then they're all like, oh, he's king, da, 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 and all stuff and everything. And, and our Lord tells the apostles, you know, get in the boats and get over there. You know, sail across the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias, you know, row your way, get across there and get away from all of this stuff. And the next morning, they've, they've gone to Capernaum. Our Lord walks across the water to get to Capernaum. And, uh, and then the crowds find him the next day. Now, the crowds are the ones who'd fed in the wilderness. And they're like, where'd they go? Oh, wait a second, their boats are gone. They must have gone back to Capernaum because everybody knew that's where they were from. Peter and Andrew, the brothers, and James and John, the brothers, they all have their little fishing company there. Uh, so that's the crowd's like, oh, that's where they're from. They've gone back there. So the crowd goes around and encounters our Lord. And our Lord, and they're like, oh, how did you get here? And, you know, they want to have this, like, you know, church and ice conversation with him. And our Lord just calls them to task immediately. He says, you have not, he's, first of all, he says, amen, amen. Two amens, by the way, two amens uh, is testimony in Jewish law of the time. If you say amen and somebody else says amen, those are the two witnesses. You have to have two witnesses to testify to the truth of what's being said. Notably that our Lord himself is his own witness to his own uh, testimony, which is why he says amen, amen so much 
in Scripture. So testifying to himself, because he can do that, he says, amen, amen, you have not sought me out because you believed the sign, the miracle, you haven't believed that, but because you had your fill of the loaves. You figured, oh, hey, look, here's like an ATM God machine. We can do whatever we want. He'll just give us bread. And we don't have to worry about, you know, whatever, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, what do they do? They immediately say, uh, well, wait a second. Moses, see, they understand the connection. Moses gave our forefathers bread in the desert to eat. What sign can you show us? Okay, so go back to the board here, guys, for a second. The second thing is the crowd themselves bring up Moses with the prophet. In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses makes the prophecy that a prophet, the prophet, uh, will arise and he will be essentially the new Moses. So at the multiplication of the loaves, and all of a sudden they're all looking around going, hey, wait a minute, this is just a couple of pieces of bread and fish, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, thousands of people are eating, eating their fill. There's 12 baskets left over, there's all kinds of things. And you'll notice if you read it very carefully in, I believe it's Mark's gospel, that account, it says specifically, they said to themselves, this must be the prophet, not a prophet, this must be the prophet. Whenever the Jews were talking about the prophet, they were talking about the prophet that Moses had prophesied. So they recognize the day before, the end of the miracle of the loaves, they recognize, hey, wait a minute, this is the prophet. And then that's when our Lord you know, tells us, Bishop Sheen says, you know, everybody's going crazy, going, oh, let's make him king and this and that and everything else. And our Lord, and of course, the apostles are getting all you know, swept up in that. And our Lord says, cut it out, you know, get, you know, center yourselves again, knock off your egos. That's not how this is going to play out. Believe me, this is not how this is going to play out. Get in the boat and go to the other side. And then our Lord goes off the mountain, prays, walks across the water, and then we pick up the story in Capernaum the next day. And they say, oh, well, see, now they're a little irritated because they're like, oh, this is the prophet, and, you know, it's Moses, and he's going to lead us, and, you know, go overthrow the Romans, and da 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 da, da. And so they say that Moses, you know, what sign can you show us Moses gave our forefathers bread in the desert to eat. And an interesting rebuke to this, and actually you make this part of the uh, very opening of our Eucharist documentary, God's Lamb, that we did uh, in the Holy Land, standing right there where this conversation happened, as a matter of fact, between the Jews and Jesus at Capernaum. And uh, our Lord says to them, amen, amen, again, the, the double testimony of his own accord, amen, amen, I say to you, it was not Moses that gave your forefathers bread in the desert to eat, but my heavenly father. So sort of claiming the things of God because he's God, he claims them back. But the point for our uh, discussion here on typology is that the crowd at the multiplication of the loaves and the next day in Capernaum recognize the linkage between Moses and our blessed Lord. Okay, so let's go to the next board, guys. Moses, of course, is directly tied to the ark. He's the one who oversaw the, the construction of the ark. So it plays, I'm gonna to roll to the next one, guys. It has a central role in the Exodus. It is the ark, uh, once they get to Mount Sinai, uh, it is the ark and the construction of it and all of that that, uh, that becomes sort of the guidepost to get them to the promised land, even during the 40 years of you know, all the horrible stuff that went on and the worshiping of the golden calf and all that. So if, there, if that's the central role in the Exodus, that means if our Lord is the new Moses then, and there is a new Exodus, well then the new Exodus requires a new ark as well. Remember, everything is a type of something larger than it fulfilled in the New Testament. Then of course, what is the ark? Well, the ark is the dwelling place of God on earth. Very important thing to understand here, that the dwelling place of God on earth, because he so designates it himself, that the ark in the tabernacle, which is the tent, uh, is the dwelling place of God on earth. He designates it himself. Now, I want to go to a little overview of all of these informa all this information about this. So let's start the first one here. That's King David leading the ark into uh, uh, leading the ark into uh, uh, the tabernacle in Jerusalem, all that. We'll get into that. So that's a few hundred years from now. So we'll get to that, you know, tomorrow or the next day. Uh, God commands how the ark is to be constructed. It is God himself who commands it. The only other time we've had that done specifically at this point was Noah's ark. 
So every time there is some salvific uh, focus on something even of the material universe that shows its significance, its importance in the divine plan and the divine economy, it is God himself who directs how it is to be done. Fast forward to the temple and fast forward to the Last Supper as well. This is how you will do it. You know, you shall take the bread, bless it, blah, blah. you shall build the temple, it shall be this long, this big. When God says, back off humanity, I love you, but you're going to follow my precise directions on how this is to be built, then that means wake up and pay attention to what's going on right here. So God commands how it is to be constructed. He gives meticulous detail. He's, he's the divine architect here, and nobody is going to mess up his vision of what the finished product of this is going to look like. Next one. So he says it should be made of acacia wood and then overlaid with gold. First of all, acacia wood was considered uh, uh, essentially divine wood that was indestructible. It had a divine quality about it uh, with the Egyptians, and uh, it, was, it, you, it would just never corrupt. It would never corrupt. It was just long lasting, you know, forever. So God is the one who says, that's the type of base material I want the ark made from. Something that is absolutely indestructible. In, it cannot be defiled. It can't be corrupted in any way. That's the nature of it. Then I want it overlaid with gold. I want it overlaid with gold. The word for gold used in the uh, Hebrew scriptures here is actually pure gold, which means cannot be corrupted. It is to be placed in the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle at the time when our Lord or when the Lord God, I'm trying to make the distinction because our Lord as Jesus doesn't exist yet. He's He's just the eternal Logos, but he's not Jesus yet. So I keep, sorry, I keep jumping back and forth between his name. It's like Trump telling people to drink bleach. Uh, you know, you just got to kind of roll with the punches here. Uh, the tabernacle at the time was a giant tent. And that tent was where God said, I will, that is where I will dwell with you, among you. Then, next board, the ark itself he designates is where I will meet my people. So inside the tabernacle, the tent, the ark is placed and the ark itself becomes the place where he meets. So he is there and because of the ark, he is able to meet his people. He's not just there, but he's there in such a way that he is accessible. That's God talking. This, is, this will be my dwelling place. This is where I will be among you, and I will meet you there. I shall meet my people there. That's two steps. It's not just, oh, there's the, there's the box inside the tent. It's the tent itself is the environs for where, uh, because God is there. Just because God is there doesn't mean you have access to him. So that's what he says. He goes, first step is here I am. Second step is, this is where we will be able to meet. We will have our exchange. I can meet with you here. Once, uh, you know, in a few hundred years from now, when all of this, you know, this was roughly about the, the story of the Exodus and Mount Sinai, that's roughly 1400 BC. It isn't until about 1000 BC when David uh, conquers the little villages around what's modern day Jerusalem and builds a city of David. And then uh, uh, Saul, uh, uh, Solomon comes along and builds the temple and all of that. That's roughly 400 years later, uh, when they, and you have the Holy of Holies and all of that stuff. But anyway, that's uh, neither here nor there. We'll get to that later. Uh, I'd like to, just to sort of underline this, I want to show you the, the meticulous detail, don't take my word for it, but that comes from the book of Exodus on how this is to be built. And this is uh, quoting uh, the Lord God. They are to make a sanctuary for me. Sanctuary, of course, means holy place. They are to make a sanctuary for me that I may dwell in their midst. This is God doing the designating of what's supposed to be going on. According to all that I show you regarding the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of its furnishings, so you are to make it. I'm going to show you how to do this, and that's what you're going to do. You shall make an ark of acacia wood. And look at the detail of this. Two and a half cubits, cubits long and one and a half cubits wide and one and a half cubits high. Plate it 
inside and outside with pure gold, pure gold, and put a molding of gold around the top of it. Next page. Cast four gold rings and put them on the four supports and put them on the four supports of the ark. Two rings on one side and two on the opposite side. Then make poles of acacia wood and plate them with gold. These poles you are to put through the rings on the sides of the ark for carrying it. They must remain in the rings of the ark and never be withdrawn. That's so that when you're carrying it, you never actually touch the ark itself. The ark is untouchable because it is so pure. It is, that's the pure gold thing there, that the wood, you are never, our human hands to touch this. Human sinful hands are never to touch this immaculate box of indestructible wood and pure incorruptible gold. You can see where we're going with this. So, and we're going to continue to go with that tomorrow uh, as well. I just, uh, what did the finished product, if you want to call it that way, look like? A number of artists have, uh, you know, drawings. I mean, it gets much more specific. We'll finish up some more of the detail of it tomorrow. I didn't want to present too much all at the same time. Uh, there's uh, a number of artists have tried it, and remarkably, because the directions are so specific on size and everything else, uh, that it's, uh, it's, it's interesting as you look at everybody's uh, rendition of this, how very similar they all look. We just pulled up one as an example for you here. This is, now this is a tiny little desktop version of it, but the proportions are all still correct. You can see that there are the, the rings, the, the, the acacia wood with gold overlaid, the whole thing's gold. We haven't gotten into the part yet about the angels on top and how they're to be in the seat of mercy and all that. We'll get into all of that tomorrow, but... Uh, just wanted to give you a, uh, a visual on what this would have looked like. This, you know, whether those actual designs of the diagonal grid and stuff would have been there or not is, you know, kind of anybody's guess. But those do bear a great resemblance to the uh, uh, to uh, Jewish artwork uh, of the time. So anyway, that's an example of what it looks like. That what went into the ark was the Ten Commandments. Uh, the staff of Aaron that he used to, for example, throw down on the, on the ground and ate up Pharaoh's serpents, and a golden bowl that had some of the manna from the desert in it. So we have the law, we have the sign of the priesthood, the staff, and we have the bread from heaven all sitting inside that box that is totally pure and can never be touched or approached. See where we're going with it. And we'll continue going there tomorrow. Right now we're going to take a few questions. Let's take our first question, guys. If Martin Luther believed Mary to be immaculately conceived, then why do modern day Protestants deny this dogma? It's interesting. You know, there's a lot of things. I think Martin Luther would wig out if he came back and saw what Lutheranism uh, has become. This is what happens when you split away from the truth particularly if you say, I'm going to split away from the truth and, you know, I, I'll take some of that and I'll leave some of it and I'll form my own little thing here. All right, for the first, you know, week, month, couple years, whatever, things are relatively similar. But then somebody else inside there gets the idea, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, I don't particularly like that thing. Let's throw that out. And all of a sudden it just splinters and splinters and splinters and splinters. So now you have 40,000 different uh, Protestant groups uh, all claiming that, you know, they've got the truth and this and that and everything else. Well, even Lutheranism, it, it, Martin, Martin Luther didn't begin Lutheranism, but it began because of him. But even now in the United States, there are three different branches of Lutheranism. Uh, Missouri Synod, ELCA, which is the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, the Missouri Synod, and the Wisconsin Synod. And those three groups... Uh, You'd be hard-pressed to find an awful lot they agree on, even within the world of Lutheranism. And then when you kind of hightail it back over to Europe and you go to the uh, Nordic countries and Germany, which is kind of a, the heart of Lutheranism uh, in Europe, it's all completely broken apart there also. Um, even with regards to the Eucharist, uh, you know, Martin Luther believed, uh, kind of a 
a spoiled, weird thought, uh, but he believed that the Eucharist was the real presence, but it was not through tra transubstantiation. He believed that there was both Jesus present and bread present at the same time. So God had like mingled himself into bread. Uh, but, you know, some Lutherans still believe that today. Others don't believe it today. Why don't they believe? Well, I mean, look, beliefs change. When they're, not, when they're not rooted in anything except one guy's opinion or, you know, a few, two, three, four, whatever guy's opinion, well, it's just their opinion. It's not rooted in anything. So, you know, you can have people decide to hold on to that opinion for a month or a year, 10 years, 100 years. But somewhere down the road, someone else is going to come along inside that group and have their own opinion. That's what opinions are. And when somebody else has another opinion, if they feel strongly enough about it and the other people give them pushback on their opinion, they say, okay, fine, I'll go start my own thing. And that's why it is. Uh, the idea that uh, to go you know, to the original reformers, which were rev actually revolutionaries, uh, and, uh, and to point out to people that they believed an awful lot of this Catholic stuff, uh, their big gripe was authority and papal... Uh, papal authority and the church's authority. It was not many of the teachings of the church. Those are teachings, obviously, also. But the specific teachings as they applied, for example, to Our Lady, they didn't have a beef with them at all. So it's an interesting development. It proves out that over time, the more disobedient you become, the more you, you venture away from the truth. Next question. What is the relationship between Mary and the souls in purgatory? Well, this is very interesting. You know, if you have a, uh, uh, the green scapular, uh, which, you know, is opposed to the brown scapular, which is uh, uh, if you die wearing that scapular, given to St. Simon's stock, the promise is if you die wearing the scapular, and, you know, you're living a good life. It's not magic. Uh, none of the sacramentals are magic. But if you die, uh, you know, wearing that scapular, you should, the brown scapular, uh, you will not suffer the fires of hell. The green scapular uh, is built around the devotional uh, uh, practice and belief that, uh, that on the Saturday after you die, that our Blessed Mother will come to uh, purgatory and uh, bring you to her divine son. Um, it's a really wonderful devotion. You think about, I mean, again, remember what purgatory is. While there's the suffering and the pains, you know, pains of hell, and not, except the absence of God, which is, you know, kind of a big thing. Uh, but, you know, you get out of purgatory and you know it, but you've beheld for the briefest glimpse something of the divinity of God. And then you're like, I'm not good enough yet. I got to go get cleaned up <laughs> and I got to get rid of all this horrible stuff and pay for everything I've done. And so let me off into purgatory with me, uh, you know, to go get cleaned up. But you know what's waiting for you. So even more than the, uh, the pains of purgatory, the suffering souls in purgatory, is the longing for what's coming. You've had just the slightest little glimpse of it, and now you're, I just, so the, the ang not anxiety, wrong word, the longing for purgatory, uh, for heaven, for the beatific vision, is the greatest pain of purgatory. Not the only pain of purgatory, but is the greatest one. Like the greatest pain in hell is that you know that's what you're supposed to have and you'll never see it. Uh, never have it, never possess it forever. Uh, but Our Lady uh, loves the souls in purgatory. The souls in purgatory are saved. They're just not in the beatific vision in any sort of complete form yet. But they're saved. They are the elect. And so our Blessed Mother has special care for them. And, you know, if you read through many of the various uh, uh, saints and private revelations, you'll see that uh, they mention that on her feast days, for example, that she makes special visit to the souls in purgatory. She's the emissary, if you want to say uh, that, uh, the emissary from heaven, like she was the emissary of heaven uh, to St. Elizabeth and St. John the Baptist. Uh, she brings something of the glory of heaven and it, re and it, it uh, relieves the pain uh, to a degree of the souls in purgatory just looking at her. Because, you know, you are the, as we say in the Psalms, you are the glory, as we read in the uh, Psalm today, you are in the book of Judith, you are the glory of Jerusalem. So you see her and it's like, oh, you know, the, the, it's not that the pains go away, the pains are there, but they're so completely overridden by the beauty of, of the most beautiful creature God has ever made that you can deal with the pain because of what you're looking at right now. 
Uh, it's, uh, it's a really beautiful thought that, you know, here's, and what, what is it? What is that? That's our mother being tender to those, you know, it's <laughs> on human terms. I'm sure this doesn't happen, but on human terms, it's probably like our lady saying to our blessed Lord, ah, oh, come on, give him a little break. Let me, I'm, I'm going to go down and like ease things for him a little bit. You know, I know you got all the divine justice and all that stuff and everything, but I'm the mother of mercy. So let me run down there and just kind of, you know, make it a little easy for him. It's, you know, that's a, <laughs> theologically completely incorrect, but anyway, it's, it's a lovely thought. But however, however that happens in the divine economy of all that, it's all baked in already. Uh, so our Blessed Mother uh, has a great love for the souls uh, in purgatory. That's the relationship. Last question. Now that some states are beginning to resume public mass, do you think the bishops will recover lost finances? Not a prayer. Not a prayer. Where do the bishops get their finances uh, from? Uh, well, from a number of places, but specifically with regard to parishes, which is the thrust of that question. Uh, they tax. I mean, every bishop in every diocese taxes his, uh, uh, his parishes, and they give, it depends on what diocese you're in, and, you know, uh, you know, there's probably even varying amounts within a diocese, but let's just say it's roughly 10%. From everything we've been able to glean, it's somewhere between 8% to 14% as the one time getting the money out of a parish, so eight, call it 10% just as an average. 10% of everything you throw in the basket on Sunday winds up downtown in the bishop's pockets for him to do whatever he wants to fund the diocese and pay the chancery staff and unemployment and compensation, you know, pension and retirement plans and health insurance and whatever. Uh, when you're the normal cost of running a business, because that there is that aspect of the church, it's here on earth and you have to take care of material needs as well. Unfortunately, they spend way too much time on material needs and essentially ignore the immaterial needs. So... Uh, if you think about the amount of money, uh, and again, depends on what particular diocese you're in and what state you're in, but for example, the Archdiocese of Detroit, where we are, we've been closed here since I think it was March 21st or 19th or whatever it is, somewhere around there, and we're going to be closed, uh, you know, which what will amount to roughly, roughly eight weeks when this is done, and that's presuming we open up on May 15th. That's, that's eight Sunday collections that the Archbishop here, Alan Vigneron, did not get 10% of. And here in Detroit, it's almost 14%. So how's he going to go make up? I mean, you're talking about almost a whole quarter's worth of revenue at that point. And then, even when the church is open back up, uh, you know, you can bet your bottom dollar some of these people aren't coming back. I mean, they will have learned in this time, this kind of weak water, church and ice Catholics, they will have learned, eh, yeah, you know, whatever, can, uh, you know, oh, we got along fine without mass, that's fine. Maybe we'll, you know, and they'll just sort of drift into the Christers, the Christmas Easter Catholics. They may pop back in every now and then. Some parishes are going to close. They're just going to close. The financial hardship on that individual parish will simply be too great. So there will be fewer parishes when this is done. And the parishes that have people in them, the same number of people aren't going to come back to them. And you have a deficit. If you're the bishop of a particular diocese or archdiocese, you have a deficit. How are you going to make that up? Well, so fewer people are coming, uh, you know, a, a, a less, lesser amount of time. So you're going to just take more from the few people who show up. And that's just to get you back up to even. And remember, on top of all of that, there's also the annual collection that happens, goes around once a year, and every diocese calls it something different. They hire some marketing firm to come in and give it some, you know, cool scriptural sounding name and, you know, whatever, you know, the, you know advancing the gospel or whatever. It's just ridiculous. Anyway, uh, and they have, uh, they, they bring it in and, and they take money from you that way. There are going to be fewer parishes and there are going to be fewer Catholics who will return after all of this. So that's going to hit them. And they've already lost a pretty good amount of money. Eight to ten weeks begins to be roughly 15 to 20 percent of the year of the revenue that would come in during a year. And we're going into the summer, not so far off, although in Michigan here, you never know if that's ever going to happen, but uh, when you get into the summer, fewer people go to Mass. That's why they sometimes cancel the morning Masses and things like that. People are traveling around, they're on vacation, they're here, they're gone, they're everywhere, and probably after all this shut in, people will love to go somewhere to just get out of their houses. Uh, yeah, I think this is going to be a major financial uh, hit uh, for bishops all over the country. Not evenly distributed, but I don't see how it can't be. You haven't had people if you, know, if you want to think of it in pure business terms, you've had no 
customers sitting in your stores giving you money. That's a problem. That's a problem. So uh, every day we wrap up, of course, with the, uh, our prayer to St. Michael. Before we go, just a shot inside our chapel to remind you that we say evening prayer at 4.45 uh, every day there and morning prayer at 8 a.m. and followed immediately by the rosary at 8.20. Those are all Eastern times, 8, 8 in the morning Eastern, 4.45 in the afternoon Eastern. Please join us. Now we will say our prayer to St. Michael, wrap up as we always do with that prayer. It's up there in Latin. We'll pray it first in English. Yes, we will. Guys in the control room, we will pray it first in English and then we'll say it, uh, pray it in Latin. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Sancta Michael Archangelae, defende nos in prelio, contra iniquitiam et insidias diaboli esto presidium. Imperati li Deus supleceste precamor, tuque princeps miletiae celestis, santa namoliosque spiritus malignos, qui ad perditionem animadem pervagantur in mundo, divina virtute, in infernum de trude. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Wraps us up for today. We'll see you tomorrow, 1 p.m. Eastern time right here. Tell your friends, join us. A few thousand people watch this show every day. That's really, that's really heartening. And uh, again, if you've got comments, suggestions, questions, whatever, send them in to us. We're happy to incorporate whatever we can into the show or open to whatever ideas. Again, it's very informal, at least through the Wuhan time. Uh, we're very informal. We're happy to hear from you. hope you're getting something out of it as uh, we are bringing it to you. Thanks very much. We'll see you tomorrow, 1 p.m. God love you.